Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar today, co-sponsored by XWrite and Nick Software. We welcome Laurie Rubin from Nick Software and, of course, our good friend Chris Orwig, who is part of our XWrite Colorado program. My name is Brenda Hipsher, and I'm a field marketing manager with XWrite Photo. Chris Orwig brings a unique perspective, technical expertise, creativity, and passion to all that he does. He's authored over 40 online training courses on lynda.com on the topics of photography, Photoshop, and Lightroom. Chris is on the faculty at the world-renowned Brooks Institute in Santa Barbara, California. He's authored a number of best-selling books, including his two most recent books, Visual Poetry and People Pictures. If you haven't enjoyed his TED Talk, I personally highly recommend it. I watch it uh, over and over from time to time because it's just so good and so inspiring. And as you'll soon discover in this webinar, his passion for life, photography, and teaching run very deep indeed. We're honored and delighted to have educator and photographer Chris Orwig with us today. Brenda and Lori, thanks so much for coordinating this. I'm really excited about this. I want to give just or go through a few opening slides and then we'll dive into some really great content. Um, I teach at Brooks. It's one of my life's biggest honors. Um, I've also done a lot of courses at lynda.com. If you've watched any of those, thanks. I really appreciate that. And I've written a few books, which was really fun to do to kind of articulate how I approach photography. And really at my core, I'm a photographer. And I like to capture images of all sorts of things. And for me, photography is a way to, to save our life. And I came across this great quote by Henri Cartier-Bresson who said, you don't live for photography, you make photographs because it fills you with life. And somehow I found that photography does that. It, it brings and adds life. And today, um, we're going to look at how we create compelling photographs or good photographs. And I think a good photograph is one that makes you feel something. And that's true whether it's a photograph of my daughter here on the left, Annika, my oldest daughter, or world-famous actress and celebrity, Isabel Lucas, on the right. We want to capture and create these images that have that little extra element in them. And in particular, we'll look at how we can work on our images in post-production in order to try to bring that out. You know, for me, the foundation of all of this creative, fun, expressive stuff is good color management. And I don't need to kind of get into this too much, but I do have to say that I teach college students. So I'm trying to convince them and to share with them why this makes sense. And so for me, these are the tools I use, the color monkey photo and also the passport and the i1 display. I think these are essential and here's why. Um, for me, it's kind of like tuning a guitar. And I have a guitar in my office here, which is kind of funny, but you have to imagine when you're in college and you're trying to understand what does this mean? Why do I calibrate my monitor? Well, if you play a guitar, you play a chord, it sounds fine if it's in tune. Yet if I untune this guitar, as I'm going to do right here a little bit, and then play those same notes, it just doesn't work. And so the whole color management thing, it really is the foundation. It, it, it allows you to, quote, kind of make the music. And so as we look at how to create compelling photographs, keep that in mind. And if you don't use those tools, you, you want to start looking into picking them up because they're, they're essential. Because you can't even learn how to play the guitar unless it's in tune. And then next, we're going to explore how we use Photoshop and then combine that with a couple of really powerful um, plugins. Color Effects Pro, we'll spend a lot of time there, and then we'll work a bit in Silver Effects Pro as well. And keep in mind that it is the combination of all these things which leads to really great results. It's not just the tuning, it's not just Photoshop, but it's kind of the whole deal together. All right, well, let's jump in, and what I want to do is start off with a photograph. So I'm going to go ahead and just go back to Photoshop for a moment, and I'm going to pull up an image to start off. And this is a photograph of um, Jack O'Neill, the man who invented the wetsuit. I'm a surfer, and so I am very grateful to this guy because the waters along the California coast can be cold at different times of year. And with this photograph, what I want to do is just start off with a few simple tips using Color Effects Pro. I'm going to talk about how we can change the mood or the feeling with this picture. You'll notice that we have the original image. And then we have a few adjustments. These are just curve adjustments to kind of modify the light a little bit. And what I need to do then is I want to launch the filter. Well, typically your workflow, you, you open up an image, you make some changes, and then maybe you have an adjustment layer. 
Well, if you go to the filter pull down menu and go to Nick Software, you'll notice that Color Effects Pro is grayed out. That's because I'm on an adjustment layer. I can't apply an effect to a curves adjustment. I have to go back to the image. So here we'll click on the background layer, go to the filter pull down menu, then choose Nick Software, and then launch Color Effects Pro. Now, when you're using Color Effects Pro, one of the first things you want to do is you want to take it to full screen. You can do so by clicking on that little button or by pressing the F key. Next, you want to start clicking around. You'll notice we have this filter list. Here we can simply click on these different options, and it's going to show us how these different filters might affect the photograph. Now, as you do that, you're sort of searching for something that you think might work. Well, with this particular image, what I want to do is I want to apply some cross-processing to the image because I want to add a little bit of a sort of a vintage or, or nostalgic feel to this. The workflow with this, this um, filter is left to right. You choose your filter on the left, then you move over to the right, and here we have our controls. If we go to the method pull-down menu, you see that we have a number of different options. As we go through these, you really have to kind of be on the lookout searching for the one that makes you kind of feel something. This one doesn't. This blue tint doesn't work with this image, but it doesn't mean that you give up there. You keep looking. I know um, that this, some of these down here will look pretty good. Like I think LO5 looks kind of cool with this photograph. And once you make an adjustment, sometimes you won't really realize, well, is this good or what did it look like before? So in situations like that, you can press the P key to look at your before and then let go of the P key and you can see the after. Let me increase or exaggerate the strength. This won't look good, but let me show you this. Press the P key, there's our before, let go of the P key, there's the after. We can also go up to one of these views like this split view where it shows us the original here and you can hover over this little red line to look at the before and after so that you can see the before and after in the important areas of the photograph then to go back to the single view, just click that icon there. All right, well it's all about finding just the right amount for this. Well here with this image, I'm gonna decrease the strength, and I think the strength that it came in with looked pretty good, somewhere around 30% or so. And sometimes when you're working with color effects or anything in Photoshop for that matter, it's the subtle yet significant adjustment. Sometimes all you need to make is a simple adjustment. Other times, as you'll see later, we're going to stack up and do some really advanced adjustments, but for now, I think this works. When you're ready to apply this to the image, all that you need to do is to simply click the OK button in the bottom right-hand corner, or press Enter on a Mac, or excuse me, Enter on a on Windows and return on Mac. Here you can see we now have our before and after. There's the before. Now here's the after. Again, it's a pretty simple adjustment. It may be difficult to see once this screen becomes small, but in this case, it's the subtle adjustment that works really well for me. All right, well, let's take it up a notch. Let's really dig into this. I'm going to open up another image, and this is a photograph, let's see if I have it open, of Rob Machado, a world-famous surfer, a really fascinating character. And I love the color and the tone of this image, but I just want to experiment and see if I can't create sort of a a vintage film effect with a border around the edge. To do that again, we're going to launch the filter. Now if I go to the filter pull down menu, you'll notice that the last filter you applied, whatever it was, blur, pixel, or in this case, Color Effects Pro, it appears at the top and there's a shortcut next to it. Well if you press that shortcut, it will apply the last settings you just used. Yet if you add a modifier key to that, it will relaunch that dialog so that you can select new settings. On a Mac that's Command Option F, Windows that's Control Alt F. I recommend you write that down if you want to get advanced with working with these filters. Again, Command Option F, Mac, Control Alt F, Windows. Well for the rest of us, if you don't like shortcuts, no big deal. Just go to Nick Software and then choose the filter to launch it. Well, as I mentioned, with this one, I'm really interested in coming up with a kind of a curious effect. So here I'm going to start off with cross balance. With cross balance you can see that it's giving me this unique look. Once you've selected the filter, jump over to the right and then go to this menu and just see what the other options are. And in this case the filter I used last time, Tungsten to Daylight 2, who I think is pretty cool. Here we can dial in the amount, you can see the strength without that or with this. 
And I think it's kind of fun to see how his eyes are changing color and the background a bit. And what I want to do is I want to take this even further. I want to apply a cross balance like we see, plus I want to cross process the image. In other words, I want to stack up a few filter effects. Well, to do that, you can click on this Add Filter button and then add another filter. If you don't click on this button and just simply choose, let's say, Cross Processing, you notice that it will replace whatever filter we last applied. So again, we want to go to Cross Balance and then click on Add Filter. And now this time I'll choose Cross Processing. Well, now that I've selected that, you can see that I have two filter effects which are stacking up together. And in this case, just to be consistent, let's go ahead and use that last uh, option we did with the previous image, L05. And here you can see how it's affecting the image. Click on the checkbox, there's the before, now here's the after. Much more yellow in the image. We kind of have this yellow, blue, blue type of a look. And again, I'm just trying to have a bit of fun with this image. And that's what's great about photography and post-production is we can express things in so many different ways, just like the musician can take three chords and make many different songs, right? And so here we have this, and I've decided that while this is interesting, it might also be fun to add some film grain. Well, we could click on the Add Filter button, or you can use a great shortcut key, which allows you to add a filter without having to click the button. And here it is. If you move over to the filter list and you find whatever filter it is, in my case, film grain, all that you have to do is hold down the shift key. And the shift key in Photoshop and, and in other applications usually means add. So I'll hold down shift and I'll click on film grain and you see that it will add that to my stack of effects here. Well, now that I have that, let's talk a bit about how this works. I'm going to exaggerate for a moment. The image will look horrible, but just let me off the hook. Um, because I think it will illustrate a good point. When I take grain per pixel to one, each pixel in this image, let's zoom in on it, um, has a little piece of grain. Again, it doesn't look good, but it'll help us illustrate a point where if we choose soft, that grain's going to be pretty soft and a little bit more subtle. If we choose hard, we're going to see how there's those hard edges on it. Perhaps if I decrease this a little bit, there you can see here soft, it's a, kind of a soft look, and then hard has those hard edges contrast, it allows us to use contrast to blend this in. You can see how that's affecting it so that the grain is sort of sitting on top of the image or blended into it. All right, well, I've kind of wrecked this photograph. What do you do? What do you do when you've used sliders in a way that you've made a mistake? Well, you can always double click the slider, just like in Lightroom, and it will take it back to its default setting. In this case, I'm just double clicking those and now I'm back to where it was when the image opened up. Well, here in my grain per pixel, I don't want too much grain. So I'm going to leave this at a pretty high amount. So we can see that you know, there's a lot of kind of smoothness there. And then I might make this a little bit harder, kind of nice edgy look, and then perhaps just bring up the contrast a bit. Now, at this point, all of this is really to your own preference. There's no perfect way to add film grain. It's more about how do you want to interpret or how do you want to kind of create an image that has a certain type of mood or feeling. All right, well, now that we've done that, I want to add a little bit of a border. And I want to add a border that sort of cuts into the image. It allows me to, in a sense, recompose a little bit. So to do that, I'm going to go over to the right and find one filter called Image Borders here. To access that, hold on the Shift key and click on Image Borders borders. Move to the right, and let me zoom out so you can see the full image. Um, you can zoom out with your normal shortcuts, command plus or minus on a Mac, control plus or minus on Windows. And we have different types of borders. Some are kind of sloppy and lots of um, details there, kind of gra really graphic. Others, if you get down to the bottom, are just solid colors, black or white. So in this case, I'll choose one which is relatively simple. In regards to the size, I can increase that. You can see how it's cropping into the image there decrease that, but you can push it out to the edge. So here I want to bring that in. Next for the spread, what you can do is you can increase that edge. Here I want to bring that almost all the way out so I have a really thin border. You can also make this more clean, so you can kind of clean it up, or you can make it more rough, and I guess we need more spread to be able to see that. You can sort of see how it's more straight, it's a straighter lines or um, more rugged or rough lines. If you want to use a particular border again and again, let me zoom in to kind of show you this, 
um, what you can do is click on Vary Border. And if you look closely, I'm hopefully, hopefully you can see it here, it should show you how that's kind of the, the distressed edge is sort of dancing around and it's, it's just being changed up. That's helpful to make sure that you don't always have the same border on each image. All right, well, this setting ref doesn't really work for me, so I'm going to clean that up and the spread. I want that to be nice and thin. All right, well, this is kind of cool. I think this works well, except the cross-processing is too heavy for my taste. What do you do if a filter is kind of overdone or, or it's too much? In a way, you want to think about filters and color and processing like adding seasoning to food. A friend of mine who was taking a cooking class said, the, the chef said, use seasoning, use spices in a way that no one will identify them, in a way that they won't overpower the food. I think that's kind of true with this type of work, right? Perhaps we want to scale it back. Well, we can go to cross-processing, and one of the things that you can do is you can modify the strength. We have that slider here, so I could decrease that a bit. You could also work with the shadows. You could bring up the, the, the detail in the shadows if they became too black, or the highlights. You can also darken those. Or if you go underneath control points, which I'll talk about later, in any of these filters, you have an opacity slider. This will control all of the various settings that you have. Some of these effects will have a lot of settings. You'll see that later. This one, just a few, but still here, I can decrease the opacity to decrease this cross-processing look. All right. Well, I think that looks pretty cool. I think it's kind of a fun version of this image. I'll press the P key. That allows me to see the before. Here's the original image. I'll let go of that. Now I can see the after. To apply all of these stacked effects, we simply need to click on the OK button or press Enter or Return. It will then process all of those, save those on a new layer, and then if we click on the eye icon here, we can see there's our before, and now here is our after. And so as we get into how we work with these, keep in mind that sometimes we'll work in ways that are a bit more elaborate. Other times, we might just make some really simple adjustments. Let me show you an example with that. Here I'm going to open up a photograph which is a beauty photograph and just zoom out a little bit so you can see that or perhaps we'll zoom in so you can see the details. This image I retouched in one of my lynda.com courses and let me just close this guy to get it out of the way here for a moment. Um, I don't know why that was open but let me just kick that closed. All right, and if we click on this eye icon, you can see here's the before, the original image, and then here's after the retouching. And the retouching that it was going for was just really clean. So again, it's nothing super elaborate, but just nice kind of cleanup of little details. Well, I want to use a NIC filter to brighten up the image, add some contrast, and desaturate it just a touch, kind of the, the finishing touch. So I want to make one of those adjustments, which is if we're talking about cooking, it's more like adding the sprinkles to the top of the cupcake, or it's like the icing, you know? And so let's look at how we can do that. Well, in a retouching workflow, often you'll save your layers. Here are mine. Well, if I want to apply a filter, what I need to do is I need to merge the underlying layers to the top so that I have something to work with. In order to do that, you need to press a shortcut key. It's a hard one but you definitely want to learn this if you want to get good at Photoshop. It's essential. Here it is. Press Shift, Option, Command, E on a Mac, Shift, Alt, Control, E on Windows. That takes your underlying layers and merges those to the top. Again, one of the most important shortcuts. It's an advanced one, but here it is again. Shift, Option, Command, E on a Mac, Windows, Shift, Alt, Control, E. Look at your keyboard and try to remember that. Shift, Option, Command, E, Shift, Alt, Control, E. All right, next step, go to the filter pull down menu, and here I just want to add just a slight modification. We'll launch the filter one more time. And in this case, not interested in doing any cross processing or anything like that. I just want to work on contrast. So I'll click on contrast only. Now, in contrast only, we have a number of different sliders. And just to kind of exaggerate, we have brightness, make the image very bright or very dark. Some of those work well, some of them don't. We have contrast, increase the contrast, decrease the contrast. Then we have contrast only. What contrast only is going to do is try to not affect the color as much. We have soft contrast, which is fascinating. What soft contrast does here, let me just really crank this one up all the way up. 
is it works in subtle ways. The image doesn't look that bad here. Compare that to the big contrast. Okay, that just doesn't work. It looks bad, right? So what's the difference? Well, here I'm going to double click these sliders so I can talk about them just a little bit. I like to think of contrast, if I were comparing them to a hammer, as contrast is the sledgehammer. I mean, it's the big one. It gets a lot of work done. And sometimes it's too big, right? What if you want to hang a picture on your wall? Well, in a situation like that, you might use a small finishing hammer. In that case, you would go to soft contrast. Again, it's a bit more subtle. It's working in the mid-tone range. So with this image, let's just remove the contrast all the way down. Press the P key. Here's our before and after. No difference, right? This is the original file. This was the one after we retouched it. We're, we're excited. We're like, yeah, this is it. But then we realize it needs a little bit more. A little bit more, in this case, contrast only without shifting the color. A little bit of soft contrast. Just makes this image look so good. Let me zoom in a bit more so you can see that. Here, I'll press the P key. Here's before. And then now here's after. And I'm going to zoom in so you can really see kind of some detail of the skin and whatnot. Here's before, and then now here's after. The trick is when these videos you know, become small and you're watching on your computer, you may not see the subtle difference. If you were sitting next to me, you'd be like, yes, that is it. You know, that's just that little touch, that little thing that that photograph needs. And so as you start using these filters, I want you to keep that in mind. Sometimes you're going dramatic and you're creating these really interesting, amazing effects. Other times it's small and subtle and no one will even know what you've done. It will help set your images apart. Here I'll click OK or press Enter or Return to apply that. And then in the Layers panel, we'll have that before and after. We can see here's the before and then here's the after. And then we also have, obviously, that overall here's the original image and then here's after. Again, combining all of these things together in order to come up with the best results. All right, well, let's jump to another photograph and let's continue to talk about how we can work with things like this. And what I want to do next is I want to pick an image out where we're going to work on something different. Here I'm going to go to my window pull down menu because I have a few images open. And I'm going to open a photograph of a famous musician and let me see if I can get that oh, right there. I think that's nice. And this is a photograph of Angus Stone, great musician from Australia. And what I want to do with this image is I want to process it in a specific way. What I'm interested in doing is affecting the background color here, and then maybe his face in a different way. Well, we can make specific adjustments by, like that by using control points. Let me show you what I mean. Here I'll go to the filter pull down menu, choose Nick Software and then Color Effects Pro. Also, as, um, as, we're, as we're at this point, I should point out too that I know that some of these things are going to be new for people. Um, also, I know there's some things that I'm not covering. I'll, I'll try to get to as much as I can. If I'm going too fast for you, know that this will be posted. You can always go back and watch it again or click rewind and, and go back. But I just want to get to the good stuff here. All right, so with this image, one of the things that I, I want to do is I want to change, say, the background. So I'm going to go over to our cross-processing filter, and I'm going to go through here and just look for one that, that gives me a nice background color. I think that's, that's actually kind of a nice look for the image. And I want this to just be applied back here. Well, we have these control points, and to add one, you can simply click on this icon here, and then move over the image and click. Now, when you do that, initially, you might not think much is happening. Well, what's interesting about this, let's exaggerate for a moment, is that if we increase the strength here, what we're going to see, and let me try to go to one which is more, which is different than the background color, like this blue one, you can see that this background is now blue. Well, how, how is that happening? Well, for starters, if we reposition this, you can see as I move this around, different parts of the image are turning blue. Now it's just affecting the shirt. Well, why is that? Well, if you click on this top icon, you notice that you can change this circle here. This is the area where it's trying to look for similar things to the area that we clicked on. In this case, the blue of the shirt. And so it's kind of going out and finding those similar tones and then making the adjustments. We can also add multiple, multiple little control points. Another way to do that is to simply click on the icon, as we've seen before, and then go ahead and click in a new area in this case, the background. I don't want that 
blue. So I'll go ahead and choose a new option. I think I forget which one we said or I said looked good, but one of those which gives you a little bit of a, kind of a yellow look there. And so now we have that in that background. Now what we can do is if I want to change all of this background, I could try to increase this, right? But when I do that, it's now affecting his face. That that isn't really working very well. Well, you have a couple of options here. One thing that you can do is simply click on this icon to decrease the size, and then you can hold down the Option key on a Mac, Alt on Windows, look at that in your keyboard for a second, and then just click and drag. And by doing that, you can see that I'm bringing around multiple little control points, so it's allowing me to sort of build up this effect there in the background. And of course, we could add other control points as well. Perhaps we want to modify the brightness of the face. Well, I'll go over to Levels and Curves, hold in the Shift key, and click on that. Then here, I'm going to click and drag up in order to brighten this, and then add a control point. Click on the control point icon, click on the face, and now the brightening effect is just being applied to here. And I'm going to exaggerate this. It's not going to look very good, but you can kind of see how I'm primarily affecting this part of the image. So what these control points allow you to do is to have really specific control over how you're modifying photograph. Well, in this case, let's say the background color is kind of neat, you like it, but it's too strong. How can we decrease the intensity of that? Well, if you go back to the effect, in this case cross-processing, and go beneath control points, and this works whether or not you have control points, you can see that we have this overall opacity slider. What this opacity slider allows us to do is to change an effect, an overall kind of global effect. We can also go to our strength slider in order to decrease the strength of that. You can see that as I'm decreasing that, it's decreasing the overall value. So in this case, the strength is going to give us the ability to tap into that area, or we could always go into a, con a specific control point, and then at that control point, we could modify that, modify the intensity of that particular effect. All right, well, let's dig into a few more examples of how we might use Color Effects Pro. Here, to apply these effects, we'd simply click OK. That would then render all those out, save those effects, and here's our before, and then now, our after. Well, what else can we do? Well, another thing that we can do is create really dramatic effects. And in this case, I'm going to go to another photograph. This one here, this desert fashion picture, has a lot of intensity in it. Well, let's say that what we want to do is really bring that out. To do that, we'll go to our filter pull-down menu, choose Nix software, and jump into Color Effects Pro. I hope as we're doing this that you're picking up a few tips along the way. This one, I'm going to stack up a number of effects. I'm going to work with cross-processing and add a film effect. I want to bleach it out, add some contrast, and then perhaps even try some other things out. Well, one of the things we'll start off with is perhaps, let's say, cross-processing. So here I'll go to cross-processing, and I'll go to my pull-down menu and choose one, and let's just try BO2. With the strength, as I look at this, it doesn't look very good. Yeah, you don't want to give up on your images. Just like if you were cooking something, it you have to wait till it's finished to really to really get the flavor and the feel of it. Same thing with writing a song, right? You got to kind of work through it. So in this case, I think yeah, this is this is perhaps okay. Well, next though, I'm going to add some film. And here we can go over to these film effects. These are really powerful, a ton of fun. And I'll go to Film Modern, hold on the Shift key and click on Film Modern. If we go to the pull-down menu, you notice we have a number of different types of film, and as I hover over these, they're going to show me different looks on my photograph. And what's great about these is they really closely replicate the way that film actually would render colors and grain and whatnot. In this case, I'll try one, which is perhaps a Fuji film, and, and just try something that, that adds a little bit of a unique color to it. Well, here you can see we have brightness and contrast. That's pretty self-explanatory. Then we have film details, and there's a little triangle. Whenever you see a triangle, if you click on that, it will open up, in this case, a whole new world, a whole new way to work on the photograph. Here we have the ability to work on the sensitivity. I could work on my reds. You can see the skin tones changing there. They're a bit more white. Here they're really orange. So we can modify that. We can also modify color saturation. You can see how I'm modifying the color in the skin there. And if we scroll down, 
we have a full curve like we would in Photoshop. We can target specific channels. Go to the red channel. We want to add a little bit more red to this or make it more cyan. So if you know how to work with curves in Photoshop, you can take advantage of that here. You can also obviously just work with an RGB composite channel to dial in brightness and contrast. And I don't want to overwhelm you with all of these controls, but I do want to highlight that you can get really specific. And if you're new to this tool, you want to dig into these different controls. Whenever you see one of those little triangles, as we saw here, click on it and just see what else is beneath it. Let's go down a bit further because if we zoom in on this picture, I think the film grain is too intense. So I'm going to go ahead and increase the grain per pixel amount, make it a little bit more hard. I think that looks pretty good. Here I can bring up my blacks a little bit as well. Okay, well so far so good. I have this effect. I think it's kind of cool. Yet I want to I want to do some more with this image. I mentioned I want to bleach it out. Well, before I bleach it out, I also want to soften the film effect. So here if we open up the control point, here we see our opacity slider and I'll decrease that, that amount there. So I'm just kind of softening the intensity of that. Next step, let's go to Bleach Bypass. This is an effect that a lot of photographers love to use. It's really fun. The trick is initially it will feel like it's too strong, but you can, you can soften that. You can make it work. Hold down the Shift key and click on that. Here we have Bleach Bypass, and I'll zoom out. And again, just the default settings here, it's a bit too, too much for, for my taste. But if you like it, go for it. I mean, you got to trust your gut with these as you're processing them. So here I'm just going to go straight to my control points, and I know that with my own style, I tend to drop this to about 50%, even before I do anything else. And part of that's because I want to sort of hide my tracks. I don't ever want someone to look at an image and think of a particular effect or think, oh, you're good at Photoshop. That's not the point point is to draw them in, to make them feel or think or, or something, to be moved by the image. So in this case, dropping that I think helps. Local contrast can help to kind of add those, that like mid-tone sort of punch or snap to a picture. And then of course we can dial in how much color and how we want that to really work together. All right, well now that I've sort of bleached that out a bit, let's add some contrast. Here I'm going to go back to our contrast filter hold in the shift key and click on contrast only. Once we have this up, we have different types of contrast as we talked about. And in this case, I just want to do some soft contrast, just a little bit there to add a bit of, of that to the image. Well, whenever you get to a point and you say, you know what, I kind of like this style, press the P key. There's before, there's how the image looked originally. Let go of the P key, look at the after, or look at that split view and drag this across the image to kind of evaluate, is this going in a good direction? I had a student ask me once, well, how do you know when it's good? What I like to do is look away and then look back, and these tools kind of help you to do that. You can also compare them side by side, and if you need more screen space, as I do here, press the tab key that will show or hide the panels on the left and the right. And that trick, that tab key trick, that works in Photoshop, it works in Bridge, it works in Lightroom, it's the same shortcut, which is really nice. Tab key will bring that back. Finally, you can go back to the single view. Well, let's say you like it. You're like, you know what, this is pretty cool, but it's a little bit too strong in some areas. We can go into those areas. We can go down and modify, you know, whatever, whatever it is until we get it just right. And then we want to save this out. Well, to save all of these stacked effects, we can click on Save Recipe. I've actually already saved this, so I'm just going to go ahead and call this Desert New 2 and then go ahead and click OK. This will take us to our recipes here that we can save for different ways that we like to process our images. The advantage of this is we could open up an image, excuse me, and simply click on one of these recipes in order to process an image with all of these settings. I'll try to show you that in a moment. If we want to go back to continuing to work on the image, we'll just go back to the filter list and then you can keep working. Like let's say that you decide maybe I want to kind of light this image on fire. I want, to, I want it to be red and yellow and orange. Well, we could do that by shift clicking on cross balance. And then here we could look to find one of these cross balance options, which really gives us a lot of really bright, vibrant colors. And we could process it this way. 
So again, you can work with these um, and continue to work with them, use them as starting points or take images further or whatever. All right, well, in this case, I don't really like the cross balance. I think that's a bit too strong. So I'll turn off that effect. I'm ready to apply this. So here we simply click OK in order to apply that, and that will then apply that to a new layer. The great thing about working with layers as we're doing here is if ever this is too, too strong, well, you can always just decrease the opacity a bit, right? If you want a little bit more of a subtle kind of snap, well, there you have it. And that's a pretty cool look for this particular image. All right, well, we've covered a lot of uh, interesting things so far. There's more to cover, and there's so many different ways that we can work with these effects. What I want to do next is kind of share with you a non-traditional way to work with Color Effects Pro. So I'm going to jump to another image. In this case, it's a photograph of my two oldest daughters, a couple of their friends at the beach. And here I'm going to go to Filter, Nick Software, Color Effects Pro. And I want to highlight two things here. One is that we can go to our recipes by clicking on that lower left-hand corner there. We could go to our custom recipes that we created and say, you know what, I want to do that desert new one we just did and click to apply that. And that could be a way to process an image. In this case, I don't want to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and just go back to my filter list. And here I'm going to choose something different. What I want to do is I want to choose a old photo effect here. And the old photo effect is this one. So I'll turn off, or actually I'll just actually delete by clicking on these X, the X's on the far right side of the effect. I'll delete those other effects so we can just look at old photo. Old photo gives you some really dramatic effects. If we scroll over these, you can see we have a lot of grain. We could, of course, soften these, but I want to use one where I have a lot of this grain, um, a lot of the structure there, the brightness. You can just see how we're, we have a lot happening to the image. And I want to do this and then combine this with some great Photoshop techniques to come up with a unique look. In other words, I want to use Color Effects Pro in a non-traditional way. Remember, it's not the ending point. Rather, it's all part of this overall process. The more you can integrate it into your workflow, whether you're working with Lightroom or Photoshop or all those things together, the better the results. So here, we'll simply click OK to this over-the-top effect. But don't worry, it's not going to look like this at the end. Next, what I'm going to do is add an adjustment layer. To do that, I'll click on the adjustment layer icon for black and white. Here we have this black and white conversion, right? Doesn't look good. Looks kind of, uh, I don't know, over-processed. Yet, if you click on this layer, the old photo layer, and change the blending mode to soft light, it will give us a really unique look. The soft light blending mode is the photographer's favorite blending mode, and you can use this with all sorts of effects, not just this kind of vintage black and white look. Check it out. So here it is. What's the difference? Well, here's without that effect. Let me zoom in a little bit so you can see nice kids here at the beach. And then click on that again. Here's with that effect. If we zoom out, you can see here's our before and here's our after. Again, we have opacity control, right? So it's a little bit too strong. So I'll just lower that, and this just gives this photo, again, this great snap. It kind of pops the photograph. Well, why do we need this black and white adjustment layer up here? When you use soft light on any kind of a layer like this, it, it blends it in and affects the color. That's not what I wanted. I wanted this sort of vintage type of uh, black and white look with a nice contrast, a little bit of film grain. Well, here we have it, or a little bit of grain structure, I should say. And I think that's kind of a fun way to process this photograph. So keep in mind, you can get really creative with all of this, and you can use all of your own Photoshop techniques to make these things come to life. All right, well, we've spent a lot of time with Color Effects Pro. What about Silver Effects Pro? What about black and white? How do we do that? Well, here I'll choose another photograph. This is a photograph captured in the desert of California in the springtime when the grasses are there and flowers are blooming. Antelope Valley, a beautiful place. And here, I want to bring this image to life and create a dramatic black and white conversion with sepia toning. So I'll go to my filter pull down menu, choose Nick Software, and then select Silver Effects Pro. It's the gold standard when it comes to black and white conversion. It gives you so many interesting ways to start to work on your photographs. Here, we can go to the left and simply click through these different options to give us kind of a nice starting point for how we might excuse me, process our photographs. 
Next, what you can do is after you've made a selection, you can go over to these controls to further modify how the image looks. In order to highlight some of these controls, what I want to do is quickly cancel out of this and open up a demo file because I think this will give you some helpful insight into how this works. Here, this is just an image with some different colors on it. I'm going to go to Silver Effects Pro. And I'm doing this because I kind of want to reverse engineer how this works. Again, as I click through these options, you're going to notice that sometimes the red will be dark or the green will be dark or the blue or whatever. Well, how is it coming up with that black and white conversion? Well, we obviously have our brightness slider, brightness, we have contrast, blacks become blacker and the whites become whiter, right? Or, and we can decrease the, ver the, the difference there or increase it. Structure, that's um, like the little detail that will look better with an image. So more on that in a second. But then we have um, these different adjustments. Let's go down to say color filter. Well, if we choose a color filter like red or orange or yellow, you can see how the different areas of the image are affected in different ways. If we get further into film types, you can see that what you can do is you can control the overall brightness in these different areas of photograph. And so let me go down to say cyan and blue, and you can see how I'm darkening up those blue areas. Okay, this is pretty abstract still, right? But what I'm trying to highlight is when you convert to black and white, it still has all that color data there. You're simply tapping into that to create dynamic, compelling, dramatic black and white photos. Okay, well, let's cancel out of this. I don't know if that helped or not, but it will become more clear as we start to hit the image. Here goes. Filter, Nick Software, and Silver Effects Pro. So fun to get to work on images like this. And with this one, I want to make it come to life, so I'm going to use High Structure Smooth. I think that will be a nice starting point. Then I have the Brightness Slider. With the Brightness Slider, I can obviously control the overall brightness, or there's the little triangle, right? Click to expand that. Here, this gives me the ability to work on my highlights, those clouds. I can darken those up a bit. The midtones, we can kind of see how that's affecting the image. The shadows, we can either darken or brighten those. So we have really specific controls. Same thing with contrast. We can work with the contrast in, in the whites and the blacks. We can really bring out different parts of the photograph. We can increase the overall contrast in different ways. Structure is fascinating. Here, we can add sort of dimension to the clouds. I don't know if you can see that on your end. Here's without or with a low highlight structure, and then here's with a lot. The clouds kind of have great shape. They sort of come to life. Fine structure, this is where you can create sort of that HDR aesthetic where there's all these little teeny details that, that come out. With this image, I prefer to have that a bit lower. Again, I'm not hitting every control and slider, but I am trying to highlight that you have a lot of precise control there when it comes to how you're working on the photograph. Next, in regards to selective adjustments, we can add control points, as we've talked about before, to make contrast adjustments or whatever you want to do to specific areas. Underneath that, we have our color filters. Here we can simply click on a filter to kind of see how it might affect the image, and we'll see that each of these affect it in different ways. Or we can use our sliders, so we could go to a filter, like the yellow filter, and really crank it up in order to try to darken the sky. Sometimes, though, you may find more luck with going to the film types. This is where you can get really specific. You can choose a film type, so this will simulate you know, a particular type of film, or what you can do is you can go right in and just start making some changes. I talked about modifying, say, the blue and the cyan, and what I want to do here is darken up those areas in the sky. Underneath, we have the ability to work with a curve. If we want to sort of bright, um, darken part of it as well. I'm going to bring up my yellows here too to see if I can brighten up some of that area. Okay, great. Well, what about our before and after? Press the P key. Here's before. Kind of muddled, kind of muddy, uninteresting. Here's after. If we need more screen real estate, press the tab key so you can see more of the image. Press the tab key again. Here we'll go to finishing touches. Finishing touches, I want to add a little bit of a sepia tone. We can do that by clicking on the toning pull-down menu. And here, if you look down in the list, about three-quarters of the way down, we have some sepia toning here. And I'm just going to click on that. And I'll add that toning. The strength, I can crank this up, make that too high, or I can decrease that to make that low. Here, let's make it high so we can see how this works. Below this, we have silver hue, and then we also have paper hue. 
The silver hue, I'm going to change to a different one just so we can see what it looks like. I'm going to make this blue. You can see with the silver toning, what that's doing is it's really affecting those darker tones. The paper hue, the yellow, that's affecting those lighter or brighter tones. Now, I kind of wrecked the image, right? I ruined the toning. No big deal. You can always go back and you can double click a slider to reset it, reset all my sliders back to their default settings, or you can go to the pull down menu and then you can just reselect the option, in this case sepia toning, that you want. And So here I'll decrease the strength. I just want a subtle sort of warming look to it. There are a bunch of other options I want to highlight here as well. We have vignetting. Here you can see we can add different types of vignetting. I'm going to exaggerate this for a moment. You can see I have a vignetting in this case which is brightening the outer edges. We can also have a vignette which darkens. We can change the shape from circle to rectangle and then we can control the size of this. Do we want this to be really all the way around the image or do we want it just on those edges as you can see there. Now this is way over the top. You would never do that to one of your photographs but you can, now that you know how that works, you can dial these in and add just a subtle vignette. All right, a couple other things. You can burn or darken edges by simply clicking the edge. So if you wanted to work on the right edge, click on that option. And then you can see here, let me increase that. You can see that I'm just darkening in an exaggerated way that right edge. The transition is how far or how soft that transition is. A higher transition amount means more transition, less noticeable. Typically, you do want to have that less noticeable look when you're doing anything like burning or dodging. Next, we'll decrease the strength. This goes back all the way down maybe to 5 or 6 or 10 percent. Just a subtle little darkening on that side of the photograph. Last but not least, we have image borders here in our finishing option. So here we can go ahead and choose different types of borders. As we've seen before, some are really simple. And then others have a little bit more of a textured edge to them. And what you can do with the textured look is you can always vary that. So as you click that, it will give you a different option. You can clean it up if you want a little bit more of a clean and then you can take away um, the darkness on the edge and of course you can always control the, the size of that. In this case I want a lot of the original composition so I'm just going to go ahead and remove some of those or lower some of those values so I have this edge just around the border. It's not cutting into the image too much. Well to apply these settings to your photograph if you're ready to you simply click enter return or press enter return or click OK if you don't like something that you've done, maybe a global adjustment, we'll just go back to that area. In this case, in global adjustments, we could decrease the contrast a little bit. We could also add a little bit more brightness. Another thing that you might want to do is take a look at how some of your highlights or shadows are doing. So you may have noticed that down here at the bottom of this dialog, we have this loop and histogram. Now this allows us to see a different part of our image. As I hover over this, it's showing me a different portion of the photograph. So if I hover over the road, I can see that in that dialog. To lock it down, simply right click and then it will show you that part of the image. Well, I don't really need to see the road, but what I do need to see is the histogram here. So I'll click on that and it's showing me the histogram, the different values. And you can hover over these numbers down here. And as we hover over those numbers, those are going to show us the values in that area. This is showing me zone zero, my darkest blacks. So I'm going to click on that. You can barely see those here, yet if we go to global adjustments and if we increase the contrast, you're going to see that I have a larger area showing me with this highlighted kind of dashed yellow line that that's what's in zone zero. That's not going to work. The, I have too much density, too much darkness, too much, too much um, loss of detail in that area. Well, if I see that, I can either change one of my sliders, I could try to protect my shadows, bring up some detail in there. You can use your different controls just to make sure that that will work well for your image. We can also do this, of course, with our highlights. And so here we'll click on zone 10, and I'm just going to recover some detail there in the highlights, and you can see how we're bringing back some of that in those areas. And then I could decrease the brightness as well. To remove that view, just simply click on that, and then it will turn that that highlighted view off. And that's really helpful to make sure that you have an image that's reproducible and that has good detail in all of those areas. All right, well let's go ahead and click OK in order to apply this. And we'll take a look at how we did with our black and white conversion back here in Photoshop. And we'll just let um, that process. And once we have that back in Photoshop, what we can do, of course, is look at the image as we have here. 
and we can turn on the eye icon. Here's that before, the original image straight out of the camera, and then here's after, after we created what I think is a kind of a dynamic, pretty fun um, black and white conversion. Now with this image, I noticed there's a little distracting element in the sky. If ever you need to, to uh, clean something up, we'll just create a new layer. We'll click on the new layer icon here, and then do any of your normal Photoshop techniques. Like in this case, I'll use spot healing, sample all layers, and I'll just go ahead and click on that and then it will heal away that little area. And again, you can do anything you want here in regards to Photoshop. And the reason why I wanted to say that was to kind of get you thinking about how you're going to integrate this into Photoshop. This is a tool that I like to use with my workflow, whether I'm launching um, SilverFX Pro or ColorFX Pro or whatever Nick, uh, plugin it is from Lightroom or, or from Photoshop. I'm integrating this into the other things that I'm doing, and by doing that, you kind of have the best of both worlds. All right, well, we're getting close to our close. I hope you're picking up a few things of value. Let's look at one more image here, and in this case, I'm going to go ahead and navigate to a photograph. Let's see if I have that one open. This one here, and I want to do something else in regards to um, Silver Effects Pro and to working with Photoshop, kind of an integrate into your workflow technique. Here, to relaunch the last filter we applied, you press Command Option F on a Mac or Control Alt F, or we go to Filter, Nick Software, and Silver FX Pro. In Silver FX Pro, what I want to do is I'm going to choose high structure again. I like those ones that add a lot of nice detail and structure into it. And I want this one to be a little bit more smooth, so I'll choose smooth. Then what I'm going to do is increase my contrast a bit and just make a nice black and white conversion. That already is pretty cool. Press the P key. Here's before. That just kind of default conversion. Let go of the P key. Here's after. I love the details in the lake and the sky. But what I want to do is integrate this into my workflow and, and kind of sneak in a little, um, a little color trick for you here. So I'll click OK to apply this. You could also dial in the other sliders and take this even further. But in order to speed things up, I'm just going to apply it as is. This is awesome. I love that conversion. One of the tricks we talked about was blending modes. Well, if you have an image which is desaturated, or if you have a black and white adjustment layer, and you use the soft light blending mode, it gives you the ability to create what I call kind of a muted contrast look. Here's that before. Now here's after. Let me zoom in a little bit on this so you can see some of these details here with this, this uh, pier in a local lake not too far from where I live. And what I like about this is just what it did to the blues, and I want to take that perhaps even further. One way to do that might be to use an adjustment, say, like color balance. With color balance, we could go to our shadows. If you aren't familiar with this adjustment, you can go to your shadows or the darker tones, and we could Make those darker tones a bit more blue and maybe cyan. We could also go to our highlights, the brighter areas of the image. We can add a little bit of yellow and maybe some red. And again, here I'm just trying to style the image. And I'm styling the image in a way by I'm using um, Silver Effects Pro in kind of a non traditional way. But that's what creativity is all about. It's taking something that people use one way, using it in another, and coming up with a different result. Take a look at, at uh, this. Well, actually, let me zoom out so we can see the whole image. So here's just the color effect, no big deal. But here's that with that Silver FX Pro adjustment. So again, that overall before and after is kind of fascinating. Here's before, it's kind of mediocre. Here's after, we're creating a different feeling with this type of image. Of course, you can always click in the layer. You can decrease opacity. You, know, you can modify this to your heart's content, but it gives us kind of an interesting way to think about our images. So that wraps up, I think, my part of the presentation. Wow. Thank you, Chris. That was amazing. Uh, Laurie, do you have any questions that you're seeing there uh, what, pertaining to Nick that you'd like to ask Chris? Um, maybe wondering, Brenda, if you could, um, or uh, Chris, talk about uh, some x ray products. I think there was a question about that. Maybe go over what Chris uses out in the field. Yeah, Chris, that would be great. We did have a question uh, asking if you were going to talk a little more about what x ray products you use and how you use them. Yeah, yeah, definitely do that. And then just to maybe add a little um, interest, um, I'll pull up an image um, or two just while we're doing that. Um, and uh, this is a photograph that I, I just saw some wilted balloons in front of a friend's um, file cabinet, and I just love the light on it. And so in situations like that, for me, the um, 
the color checker passport, you know, you snag a photo with that in it and then it gives you accurate color. And I think these colors, they're so vivid and alive, you know, and so that really helps. Or in other situations, um, we mentioned um, Linda, Linda.com. This is Linda of Linda.com, a portrait I captured of her. She's such a great person. And um, in order to get the kind of color that I needed, again, it's, it's using that so you have something on your image that has good color references that you can then, um, you know, um, have a profile for, for so that you're getting accurate color. And I, and, and I, I'm not, I don't, I'm hesitating here because I can't totally get into that whole process, but that's something that I do. Other times, I mean, just to be honest, like, like this one photo, it was at the beach, um, and, and I didn't have anything with me. I just shot it and, and hoped for the best, and the color was horrible. And then I opened it up in Nick software and I applied um, the cross processing filter, and and that was it. I was like, oh my gosh, that's perfect. That's just I just love it. I love the feeling of that. So there there is a give and take, um, but you know when you want to have the accuracy and also I think the variety of color, like the balloons kind of illustrated, um, that 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 one helps out a lot, at least in my own in my own workflow. Now you use the color checker passport and you use i1 display pro for your own personal work, right? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so then as far as the quote tuning of the guitar, which I know that was kind of funny, but um I think yeah, it's that's great. what I use. And I, and I that, Yeah, I think it works in my mind because um you know, you have the colorimeter, which is really like this external device which just kind of cuz you can tune a guitar to ear or you can sort of guess your color, but having a device where you're like that's spot on, that's great. What it it does for me is and I don't mean this in a bad way, I eventually kind of forget about it, you know, and, and I think that's the point. You don't want to have to think about, is this right, is this wrong, is, you know, am I, am I out of key, you know, you, just, you get to the good stuff. Um, so that's what I use. I use that and the Color Monkey because um, I work with, most of my students use that one, so I use both and, and, I, and I like both of them and have had great results with both. So. Yeah, and Color Monkey Photo, as you all know, will let you take uh, the, your color management all the way through to your printing process. Well, I think that some of these, exactly. uh, you know, these very, very fine subtleties that you've shown us today, you know, you have to be able to see that on your monitor. And since your monitor is your viewfinder, I mean, y it's either right or it's not right. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And and I think also for me, it's it's not something to be afraid of. I have a lot of students who get overwhelmed with color management because it's it's technical and everything but it's it's something to um, in, in my opinion to just say well just do it and then you you can and, and kinda get past that and I think that will help um, folks get to the good stuff the creative part of it um, and less hung up on on you know sort of it's almost like picking up a guitar and just hoping it's in tune you know before you walk up to the mic and you wouldn't do, you wouldn't yeah, do that. Yeah we never do know? that yeah. Uh, so Chris we did have a question from from what Sorry, uh, from one of our attendees, and I thought it was kind of an interesting question, and it goes right along with what you're saying about creativity. And the question was, how do you know where to start? Yeah, I think that, you know, that's a, the big question is where to start and where to stop. <laughs> and uh, what, what, I tr what I tend to try to do is I, I'm a bit more intuitive in my process. I know some of my colleagues are very... Um, they're almost more intellectual. Like they're like, I know that's it, and here's why. And so for me, it's sort of, um, you know, I know my analogies don't always work, but my daughter loves making smoothies, and and she puts in strawberries and puts in blueberries, and then tastes it. And so I just sort of try things and taste them. And I think that's what's great about these tools. Not to kind of, you know, say that too much, but that it gives you the chance to sort of be like, well, what would that be like? What about that? And often the trick with creativity is that it's just because you've done something creative in the past doesn't mean you will again meaning um, that one image that I processed uh, this way I, I'm not gonna do that on another image you know it just it worked for that that moment so anyway the, the point of that is it kinda gets the wheels spinning and then the stopping question is sometimes what I find is I get so excited by certain colors or the way an image looks I really have to almost walk away or look away and then come back to it. And often um, when I come back to it, I shouldn't say often, I should say every time when I come back to it I realize, oh, I went too far. And so I end up having to 
you know, lower the intensity of the effect. Um, and I think that's just the nature of, of effects as we get excited about them and you have to sort of almost double check that, you know, and make sure it, that it's that it's right. You're not kind of overindulgent with the effect, if that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. And I, I think the way you express it is really wonderful. Listen, Chris, we just can't thank you enough for uh, your uh, complete uh, and total professionalism and expertise in the way you uh, present the material here today. Well, yeah, yes. thanks a ton for having me. We should do it again. It's great. I, I only wish we had more time. And for those listening, yeah, if you if you want to um, follow up, feel free to do so. And, and th thanks for joining joining me. I really appreciate it. Laurie, did you want thanks. to say something? I just, yay, <laughs> great job, loved it. <laughs> right. <laughs> really good. <laughs> and uh, all I'll say is that if you uh, if you enjoyed today's webinar, you can get more of it on lynda.com. Uh, you can get more of it from Chris's books. Please be sure to check out that TED Talk. Uh, and if you're in the Santa Barbara area, sign up for a class at Brooks Institute and study with the man. He's, he's, a, he's an educator for sure.